Hi, I'm Wayne Goodman, Executive Director for the Landmark Society of Western New York. And I'm Larry Francer, the Associate Director. And Wayne and I would just like to thank all of you for your continued support. So, we'd like to share this informal tour and discussion of the wonderful project at Warner Castle as our holiday gift to you. And since it is the holidays, that means it's the year end. And the COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented challenges to us all, and especially nonprofit organizations, just like the Landmark Society. So certainly, uh, the annual fund for the Landmark Society takes on even greater importance this year. So we would really appreciate your generous support uh, during this year's annual fund. And Larry, if they want to donate, they can go to our website at landmarksociety.org and click that donate button on our homepage. That's right. Thanks so much, everyone. Welcome to Historic Warner Castle. I'm Jim Morasco, President of the Board of the Landmark Society. I would like to thank our sponsors for this event, Marshall Boxes and Edgemere Development. It's kind of an interesting story on how we got here. A couple years ago, Monroe County approached the Landmark Society about relocating their headquarters here as a tenant and helping them with the rehabilitation of this wonderful, iconic building. Now, when we walked in here two years ago, I can tell you, it, uh, it didn't look like this. We did an awful lot of work. We committed to the county that we were gonna uh, help rehabilitate the interior. And as such, we committed to uh, approximately $200,000 worth of renovations, which you'll see shortly. The county, for their part, agreed to upgrade all the mechanicals, and they also uh, did the exterior rehabilitation. So together, it's been a wonderful partnership and we thank them for the opportunity, and we hope you enjoy this presentation. So we're here at the uh, entryway of Warner Castle, the main entrance, and I'm joined with Millie with Highland Park Conservancy. And Millie knows quite a bit of history about Warner Castle, but also uh, the, the, the site, the setting. Um, this mm -hmm. is a beautiful Olmsted Park here at Highland Park. And so Millie, why don't you just talk a little bit about the history of the building and maybe how that uh, lines well with the, the setting in a, in a park like this. Thank you, Wayne. Warner Castle was actually built in 1854 by um, Horatio Gates Warner and his wife, Sarah Douglas Warner. And we're fortunate to have these wonderful portraits that were given to us by the great grandchildren of Horatio Gates Warner. When the Warners built the castle, it, was a, it evolved into a 50 acre working farm. So that was really the first chapter of the Renaissance, or the obviously, the obviously of this before building. Warner Castle was even. No, imagined. it was actually Horatio Gates. He built the castle and then developed the farm oh, and bought the property. And mo much of that property now is part of Highland Park. So from that point, the two things that we have in the foyer that are particularly of note are number one, the portraits, and number two, we have these gorgeous cast metal dogs that were part of the original castle and they were on the front porch and will be returned to the front porch. We have an image from pre-1900 where the dogs actually appear. Then in the early 50s when the county bought the property, the dogs then were purchased by the Angle family, great-grandchildren again of Horatio Gates Warner, and then they just recently miraculously came back to the castle. How did that happen? It was through the really the generosity of the Angle Estate okay. um, that that we were able to to get the the dogs returned, and they're beautiful. Yeah, and in in perfect condition, and they will once again be on the front porch, which is pretty fabulous. So that is the original era of the castle, and then the next era that was really important was in about 1912. The Dennis family bought the property. And that was really the second renaissance of the property in that they 
the property had gone from 50 acres down to almost two acres, and they hired a local landscape architect, Alan DeForest, to help them and guide them on the development of the grounds, which culminated in 1930 when the Sunken Garden was built. And the Sunken Garden is a huge attraction for photographers. More wedding photos have been taken there than anybody sure. can even imagine on the steps of the, of the um, Sunken Garden. But then the other piece of it is, is the gardens, which again go back to Alan DeForest design days, we have been, we in terms of volunteers, now under the auspices of the Conservancy, have been rehabilitating these gardens since 2012. So our goal is eventually to get through all of the gardens. We've got a good deal of them done, and of course they're wonderful to visit in the summer. And tell, you're with Highland Park Conservancy, yes. and I think one of the benefits of this project, at least from the Landmark Society standpoint, is that we've been able to offer some office space to a couple of, of mm -hmm. really neat um, nonprofits. One is the American Institute of Architects, yes. AIA, and the other is the Highland Park Conservancy. So for those that maybe, maybe don't know about the Conservancy, who are you and what do you do? Thank you. And I, the Conservancy is a nonprofit group that has been in existence since the middle 90s. And our mission is to, and we, we partner with the Monroe County Parks Department, to enhance, maintain, and promote Highland Park. And with that, we have our office space here. We are beyond delighted. It is the first office space we've had. So let's just say a lot of records coming out from under beds, out of garages, you know, all of the above that we're now sorting and, and getting it really well established. So we are more than happy to be here. And I also want to point out that for many years, uh, I think since 1964, uh, up until a few years ago, this building was occupied by the Rochester Civic Garden Center. Yes. Uh, so really, uh, as a preservationist, part of my thanks goes out to the County of Monroe, obviously, um, but then I also thank the Rochester Civic Garden Center for being stewards of the property for so long. Yes, we were actually, and I can say we because I was part of that organization. We actually were, had offices here or were here for 50 years, oh, wow. which is, and a lot of, or not a lot of, but some of the different like paintings and so forth were things that were donated over the years that now have been cleaned and rehung and just again, very pleased to see that happening. So Tom, here we are in the central hallway here at Warner Castle, defined by some great marble flooring, this beautiful staircase, and some uh, painted historic wallpaper. Uh, I think this would be a great area, though, for you to really go in and describe a little bit about this project's partnership and about the programming needs of the Landmark Society, and also, as the project's architect, maybe some of the design philosophy that, that you brought uh, to the project that really aligns with the Landmark Society's mission here. Sure, Wayne. Well, uh, standing here today, it's probably fully two years since we yeah, two, uh, two years. first, first yeah. walked on site and started uh, really taking a look at this opportunity uh, that came about as the county approached us to see if Landmark would, uh, would be interested in being a tenant and caretaker uh, for this building. And I think one of the first important tests there was uh, knowing that there's a certain specific program that Landmark has programmatic uh, needs from an architectural project point of view. Uh, how does that fit with the building? Because in any adaptive reuse, it's right. always best to be working with the building, not against the building. And I think right away we found that Landmark was a good fit. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, I think that the, uh, the whole philosophy was to try to have the least amount of interventions as possible. Right. 
Right, so it lent itself to the number of offices we needed. Uh, there was a very large uh, formal space that we could use as our boardroom. Uh, so that all seemed to fit. And then, uh, of course, from a more of a philosophical sense, um, this really seemed to fit overall, overall with Landmark's mission. True. Uh, coming in and trying to take care of a building, uh, make repairs, make renovations, and infuse it with new life. Well, certainly a building in need, and it was an opportunity for us to, I think, um, add, I, th I think, our mission to not only uh, this building, but also to this incredible site, this Olmsted Park that we're in. And it also really opened up the door with some nice partnerships, both corporate and with uh, the County of Monroe. Too. Right. And you were also able to draw on um, experts that you have that are members at, at Landmark as, as well. And um, so jumping from big picture planning to thinking about uh, issues of finishes and, and colors, uh, Bob yeah, Winter was right. a key individual here. Yeah, Bob Winter is a member of our organization and is um, an interior designer. And he volunteered his efforts and really helped point out some, uh, some interesting and I think vibrant colors that you see throughout uh, the building. Right. Uh, we also really pulled on just so many different um, craftspeople, this, the expertise that, that you need uh, to, to complete a project like this. The, the list of craftsmen are, is quite long. Right. And I want to just note uh, that Bob's special skill in finding um, a trim color that we applied throughout the building, regardless of what other color we used in the room, um, which given the range of colors and even you know, the range of colors that are represented here in the main hall with the, the painted wallpaper uh, was really a uh, highly skilled find. Yeah, and, yeah. It, and it really does unify the building. I think that as you see moving throughout the, the choice of lighting as well as the, the trim color really does sort of unify the, the structure. Right. So here we are in what we're calling our boardroom, and as we talked about how Landmark fit into the castle programmatically, one of the larger needs we had here was a large meeting space uh, to facilitate our board meetings, as well as a, a potentially a range of activities here. We could have social events in here, um, and this space lent itself very well to that. It's a large space. It's actually a large space that's created by joining two rooms. And um, that opening and that joining of the two spaces was already in place here as Landmark arrived here at the castle. Um, but it did create some challenges in trying to uh, make this, the space work as a single space. Uh, one of the choices we had here, again, with lighting uh, was originally there were two very different light fixtures in each side of the space and here we've chosen um, the same type of uh, modern light fixture that exists in both sides um, to create that kind of connection and unity and this is actually one of the spaces where we've uh, we have a dimming feature to the lights to uh, enhance the usefulness of the lighting but there's other aspects here that are different between the two sides. Uh, yeah, the uh, flooring here, which is a beautiful wood floor, two different flooring types, um, totally covered by materials that were down earlier, carpet. When I saw it first, it was glue, it was nasty, it was not a nice floor. Um, now it's this beautiful wood. You can see on the squares over here, it looks like individually stained, smaller center pieces. It's actually just a different wood species 
with a clear finish on it to give it that, that exact look. So as the space is uh, being used as Landmark's real public space here, uh, we are very well served with uh, work that the county did uh, previously uh, in making this room really a, a, a showpiece uh, in, the, in the castle. And one of the highlights of this portion of the room is this elaborate ceiling molding detail which the county restored, um, I believe, in the late 1990s. And there were pieces of the original uh, molding held together by horsehair, it looks like, John? It, it does, yes. It's yeah. not holding by much. Um, but uh, this is uh, sort of some of the building parts that were in the house that we, that we came across as evidence of their process here in restoring the ceiling. And again, it, uh, for members of the public that come into this space, it's, uh, it's really kind of a wow factor. So John, we think this was probably you know, a front parlor space in the castle originally, and now it's serving us as the reception space, uh, working off the main entrance. Um, we share this space um, with uh, AIA Rochester, is using the castle as their office as well, which is a nice kind of synergy between our two organizations. And you know, one of the things you, you get to see here was our uh, replacement of the lighting, um, turning the castle into a current state-of-the-art office facility. We needed to upgrade the lighting. The previous lighting, I don't know if you recall, had kind of that um, 1950s uh, elementary school kind of yeah, uh, fit. vibe to it. So uh, in order to efficiently uh, replace the lighting, we used all of the original or the, the previously installed um, electrical feeds to simplify um, installing the lighting. Um, but we've selected light fixtures that clearly uh, state that this is a new uh, modern uh, intervention in the castle. And um, they're clean lines, they're slim, they're, they're I, I think, very elegant. Yeah, quite. Uh, another detail of the room, again, is another change in flooring pattern, another way to accent a, another unique room. Uh, this herringbone pattern differs again from the other room that we looked at, and again from the room next to it. So just another beautiful, beautiful highlight of the building. That was completely covered. <laughs> again, with, yes, yes, completely covered, didn't know it was there. Right. Tom, another thing that we changed about this uh, building was this door was not here. There was a older door that they had put in at one point that was not appropriate to the, to the style. It came down a lot lower and they had put in a transom and it didn't really work. It didn't match the existing doors. Um, so we pulled all that out. We put in a brand new door. Uh, one of the things we had to do though is put in a piece of glass so the receptionist could see through to people coming into the entry. Um, another challenge we've had throughout is trying to match hardware without breaking the bank on whatnot. So we selected finishes that were matching, but not expensive, and I think we did a pretty good job. I agree.
So Jim, here we are uh, in my office and uh, I remember about a year or maybe a year and a half ago when you and I were doing some volunteer work painting, scraping in Carolyn's office and, and in this office. It looked quite a bit different than this and there's a couple of changes obviously that, you know, that we made to the office to, to really bring it up to modern standards to be used as a modern office. Wayne, it definitely looks a lot different. Um, just looking out over this beautiful room, I know there used to be a window where there's not. Yeah, that's, that's a good that? point because um, this window is still there. It's just simply boarded up on the back and on the front. Um, and that was done really for privacy because there's a, the loggia space is right behind this window. Uh, that'll be used for small meetings. Uh, so there was just a, a privacy and a noise issue we had to address. But it's reversible. It still reads as a window. You can tell it's a window. And if anyone ever occupied this building and wanted to go back to its original design, it would be easy to do that. And so I think the window, the glass is still behind. That's correct. That. Yeah, gotcha. the, the, the jam and the the sashes, everything is still back there. Um, you'll see changes like this throughout. Uh, I think that Tom Castline, our architect, his vision meshed well with our mission, which was to make sure that things are reversible and they sort of read um, as well as they can 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 be read. Um, as a historical sort of blueprint of, of the building. Now, Wayne, we also, you had a closet, you have a closet or had a closet in this right. office. And then when we kind of did, is, is that what you're talking about? Something similar with the, the powder room? Yeah, edition? correct. Yeah. So we have, uh, I had a closet. Um, we needed that closet space uh, to incorporate into our first floor powder room. So that closet was removed. Some people may ask themselves, well, why did you leave a closet door there if it's not functional anymore? And it goes back to that philosophy. We want the building to read as a historic building, and we want it to be reversible. We're not trying to trick anyone. Um, it, it would be easy to, to replicate and put a, put a closet back in. The only thing you'd have to abandon the powder room at that point. Um, so this, is a, this, is, this turned out to be a gorgeous room. Yeah. It's your office. Yeah. What's your favorite part about yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. It's a tough question. First of all, I'm, I feel fortunate. Uh, to have an office like this. It's a large office. It's, I think, um, it's a great place to conduct business, have meetings. Um, I think overall my favorite part is just the, the general aesthetics and how that the contemporary features like our lighting mesh as well with more historic features like, like the fireplace. Um, I find that the two being juxtaposed actually, um, actually fit well. I know that, that that seems like a strange statement to make, but, but I think it goes well in here. Now, um, you didn't mention this alcove, which is really unique. Yeah, um, I, I think that that's, I think that overall those alcoves for all the staff are really unique features of the building that we all like. They're, most buildings don't have these little alcoves in them because of the shape of the castle. I noticed yours is empty. It is empty right now. And yeah. it would be a beautiful spot for a statue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you think so? I think it would fit beautiful in there. You know what? That's a great idea. And I think I'm going to ask uh, some artists to commission a statue of James Marasco. We can put it there, spotlight it. People outside can see. I think it would be, I think it'd be wonderful. But I think you are right. It's a great spot for, for some artwork or some statuary. I'd have to disagree with you there. I don't think there'd be too many artists fighting over that project. <laughs> yeah, true. Okay. Thank you. So this little space here existed as a small kitchenette uh, in the castle's previous life. And it had been outfitted with some sort of knotty pine type cabinetry. And uh, we've uh, updated this space and revamped it. Uh, this is another space for uh, our sort of philosophical design choices to, uh, for something new that is a newer intervention at the castle, uh, is new, modern, clean, 
clean lines uh, in terms of a design aesthetic. So it clearly stands out as something being new. Um, but you also see this is another location where John's skills, your skills, John, in, um, in matching the, uh, the door style and the door hardware was very helpful to us. The other major intervention we did here, John, was creating this powder room. And uh, you remember we had uh, two different closet spaces here. There was kind of a recess uh, storage area over in the corner, which they had filled with a number, an unusual number of uh, toaster ovens. Um, and then there was a closet, and this closet space actually worked uh, with the room that's Wayne's office. So you combine these spaces. You actually moved this door opening, I believe, right? Yeah, this door opening is totally new. It used to be over there. And you did some nice trim work there to have a complementary profile that blended with the... Yeah, we, uh, had to, we had to patch that in, but we didn't have any of the old trim. So we had to make it new without going back and milling brand new to look like old. We just made it complementary. I think it's pretty effective. And this is another good example of your uh, matching the the door panel style and the door hardware because both of these doors are actually new in this space. Yeah, it's a nice finish. When we remodel, we don't always know what's down there until we pull stuff up. In this case, we removed the floor and found uh, that there had already been a toilet in this small, tiny, single closet, just a toilet. But we don't know what the exact layout of the room was, so maybe it was bigger, maybe it was just a closet. But anyways, we found the plumbing and we tied back into it and we reverted back to a normal bathroom. So now we're on the second floor central hallway of the castle. And you'll notice these very unique murals uh, transcend up the stairs to the second floor. Tom, tell us a little bit about the, the uniqueness and, and where they originated from. So they are not uh, original to the original construction date of the castle, but they're from the early 1900s and they're actually uh, wallpaper, but it's uh, woodblock prints. And I understand that these, uh, these patterns are still currently available. Um, we have retained this as a, as a very uh, interesting feature of the house. Um, they need a little bit of work. Uh, they could use uh, some restoration work, and we haven't really tackled that yet. But we have um, certainly looked to um, keep it in place and respect kind of the the color palette that this starts um, to establish in the house and um, even uh, some of the more vibrant colors that we have in the house uh, in the newer service spaces sort of pick up on the, um, the, the red and burgundy that's, that's in there with the, you the flowers. You have to look very close. They, they look like they were painted on there. They, so this is actually wallpaper and not a paint. Yes. The central hall has a skylight in the ceiling. Uh, comes up into a little uh, windowed monitor up on the roof. And uh, Jim, I recall you uh, assisted our executive director in some of his maintenance up in there. Well, when we, when we took possession of the building, Tom, it, it was uh, in need of a little bit of love. And uh, especially that skylight had accumulated an awful lot of critters. So mm -hmm. um, one afternoon, Wayne, Wayne Goodman and I got up on the roof. Uh, with a shop vac and uh, pried our, our way into the skylight. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as we may see on the roof, there is a drop down. Wayne was the smallest, <laughs> so we elected. Wayne drew short straw, and we lowered. I lowered him into the into the skylight with the shop You were spotter. Vac. You were you were I, yeah. both hands. Yeah. And and Wayne vacuumed out the bugs, Windexed it, 
And now, as you can see, light will shine through that skylight. When I think we first arrived here, it was pretty dark. Very nice, very nicely done. So John, here we are upstairs now in uh, Director of Preservation Caitlin Mivas' office. And this is uh, kind of very typical of the uh, issues we had in converting uh, rooms in the castle into functional office space. So uh, some of the other systems that we put into the, um, in the castle, modern sy systems, is uh, IT infrastructure. So mm -hmm. the castle is covered with Wi-Fi now. Uh, we installed, we actually, our partners at the uh, County of Monroe installed uh, air conditioning systems in all right. the rooms. And we had the light fixtures again, um, which do kind of a, a neat modern trick as LED light fixtures um, between them being on and off. They get rather transparent. Uh, when they're off, which, uh, which we thought was kind of a nice subtle thing. And this room also presented a number of uh, physical challenges, uh, again, typical of working with older structures. Y yes, when I first saw this room, that wall was covered in cork. The plaster was coming down, not just minor cracks, but actually coming off. There was evidence of water and rod in the corner. And I think we realized pretty quickly that we couldn't just salvage the plaster. It was beyond repair. Couldn't just spackle the cracks and call it good. So we drywalled over the whole thing, made sure that we screwed it into our ceiling joist. So it created a nice, solid, solid ceiling. We're not worried about it coming back down. We did the same thing to that wall. We just, when we took the cork off, the wall was shot. So we just cover the whole wall again with drywall. Looks beautiful. I think we're good to go. Right. There was other also evidence of an opening here, right. former opening yep. that you guys had to cover. There was a break so. in the trim, and we had a frame in the opening, and can't even tell it was there. Right. Turned out great. Yeah. Jim, here we are in Cynthia Houck's office. Uh, Cynthia is our architectural research coordinator. Uh, so this room really availed itself really well to be uh, adapted into this little research library because we were able to reuse all the existing shelving units that were here from the Rochester Civic Garden Center. Wayne, what type of research is conducted? Uh, well, I mean, there's different types of projects. We have everything from members who are homeowners who want to know more about their property. Um, but then there's also a lot of National Register nominations that we assist different consultants on. Sometimes we're the consultant on those projects. And oftentimes that involves uh, historic tax credit rehabilitations that require a significant amount of, of research. So it's really the perfect space to really conduct that type of work. So this isn't a Zoom background that we're looking at. No, right? this is the real thing. And behind me, uh, you see all of these uh, surveys. And these are surveys from all over Western New York and these are used from uh, people who are, are doing research for any number of 
of, of reasons. These are probably our most important primary source uh, documents that we have. So this, this room and its original layout worked out very well for what you're using it for. It now. really did. It, it really did. And you know, in this room, Jim, uh, I can specifically remember uh, you and a couple of your family members spent a lot of time in this room because uh, what people may not know is all those shelving material, it had to be painted and it had to be painted with small brushes at times. So you, you know about that. Jim. Wayne, I know that very well. <laughs> There's an awful lot of bookshelves in this room. And yes, my sons and I spent many a day painting these bookshelves. Yeah, well, you did a great job and we thank you for it. I'm glad they're put to good use. <laughs> So now we're in Cindy Boyer's office. Cindy is Director of Public Programs for Landmark. And um, this is another space um, that lended itself well to transformation into a professional office space. Um, this room actually had the Garden Center's uh, library collection in it. So when we arrived here, most of the room was taken up by really large metal storage racks, like their stacks. Um, so we cleared that out and, um, and made a few other improvements in here. Yes, it was uh, the only way to get into this room was through this adjacent office. And so we needed to put in an opening. And thankfully, this is one of the few wood frame walls where we could actually do that. So we made the opening and we were able to basically piece it back as it looks now where it looks like it's always been there, but without some, some casing. Yeah, I think you, you and your guys did a nice job of, of piecing that in. And uh, again, that's something that could be reversed in the future if desired, but there Correct. was yep. a uh, sort of passage there <clears throat> that existed that we were able to tie into. And this space here on the second floor below the previously failed roof was uh, one of the spaces that was in the worst shape in terms of plaster condition, really bad, particularly over in that corner. And this is where Jerome really worked his magic in terms of plaster restoration. Wayne had me come into the Warner Castle project early on. I was here probably, what, right a year before everybody else sort of broke through the door or something. And so it was pretty deserted. All of the rooms had a lot of challenges. Each had their own, its own challenge. And um, so I would work by myself with plastering and everything. Of course, prep is always a lot more entailed than painting itself. Mm -hmm. The end goal was painting, but right. uh, first was plastering and taking care of. This particular room that we're in now, this is Cindy's room. Uh, it had a lot of trouble. It had had a lot of water damage, especially in this area ceiling, entire ceiling, and this entire curved plaster wall that you right. see here. And uh, that was my, my greatest challenge. And my approach was to use uh, just a six inch knife and plaster. And so I re-sculpted this entire wall on the corner here and on that one to a lesser degree. But the entire thing had to be smoothed out. And, and as you know, the Plastering takes application after application layer after, after layer. application. Yep. And again, I just used a six inch knife and uh, did that. And I did have one interesting thing happen when I was working here. They had come in to break through this other wall to, to put a door in. And there was a crew working in there and it, they were sealed off with plastic. But I heard them sneak through and look and the one worker told the other guy, he said, and he referred to me, he said, this is Rembrandt. <laughs> and I had to laugh because 
I'm certainly no Rembrandt, more uh, an Andy Warhol or uh, <laughs> something like that, I would think. Anyway. Well, whatever category you want to put it in, clearly you have artistic skills here. This craftsmanship is, is excellent. This particular corner, as you said, has plaster damage, had a, a very deep crack, as I re recall, yeah. that ran almost from top to bottom there. And it was yeah. one of the places that I think when we came through here with the with the trustees when we were talking about this whole endeavor that made them kind of give pause and say, we want to do what here? Um, but uh, certainly with the end result, you could... Yeah. Uh, Everything can be handled. Uh, it just has, takes patience and, and the correct approach. That's right. all. Uh, anything I do is I taught myself, but you know, uh, a trained, skilled craftsman is, is worth his weight. Yes. It's good. Yep. Yeah. So, so Larry, here we are in your office, Associate Director of Landmark, and as appropriate for that title, you have a commanding position here on the second floor of the turret of the castle. What do you like about this space? Well, that's what I like about it, because, you know, there are these great windows, and sort of as royalty, I can look out at the masses, but there actually are, all the time, there are plenty of people out there. It's, it's really exciting to be here and see people, you know, setting up photos all the time and uh, there are lots of people out and these windows in all of the different offices, but I think especially in this office, you're in the middle of a park mm -hmm. and you get these beautiful vistas. We're right across from uh, Mount Hope Cemetery. So it's just amazing. Every season, you know, the when it snows, the snow hits these beautiful trees so beautifully and uh, it's great you know I really love being in here warm and cozy and I think it's been a real um, education on the part of all of Landmark staff what a special attraction this building is yeah. uh, in our uh, in our community and the amount of For people sure. that visit yeah um, so your office uh, is another example of converting a space in a building built in the 1800s uh, into current modern office space. So again, we had to uh, redo lighting. We added some um, electrical infrastructure, IT infrastructure, and the um, air conditioning system that the county installed uh, for Landmark here. And I would guess I would just note that there was kind of a philosophy with all of that work that um, it's, it's very direct, it's rather obvious, it's sort of all kind of surface mounted. And from that standpoint, it's reversible. We didn't right. uh, intrude into the, uh, the building fabric too much. Of course, we really couldn't because a lot of this building's fabric is extremely solid, right. uh, stone or brick, so it was very hard to get into it in some cases. But yeah, getting my IT, we had to go through right here where the pipe is. Right. I mean, that's the only way we could get up here. Right. So we face those challenges, but uh, again, uh, getting those systems in to be able to properly support um, the work that uh, Landmark staff does here. Mm -hmm. And this room uh, is uh, the exact same footprint as uh, top of the tower, one floor up, yep. which we'll head to next. Great.
So here we are at the room at the top of the turret of the castle, classic castle space. And this is really kind of uh, illustrative of original conditions of the castle. Interesting, this was intended as a finished room. Yeah, it has hardwood flooring, I have trim on the windows, a heat source. Um, it must have been pretty decent in the, its day when it was new, but now it's pretty raw. You can see a different types of uh, methods for building in this, in this space. We have studs with lath and plaster on it, masonry with plaster on it, and this is pretty much what was done in the whole building. Right, so a lot of the plaster conditions we found downstairs and corrected looked like this. Right. And um, the cause of most of that plaster damage was water infiltration, um, years of water infiltration. And one of the things that enabled Landmark's project here was in our partnership with the county, Monroe County. The county made a substantial investment in a brand new roof up here and extensive masonry repairs on all the crenellations on the outside wall of the castle. So the county did a really nice job with the work outside. Um, they took uh, the appropriate amount of care in um, reconstructing and restoring the, the masonry tops to the walls, um, getting new flashing in there. They used copper flashing. Um, so it was a good uh, sort of long-term um, high quality workmanship solution uh, to the problems of uh, needing to make the building watertight again. Wayne, this is a very unique room and it looks nothing like uh, the condition it was in when we first moved in. No, no, it's, it's not even close, you're right. What, what was it being used for at that time? Well, I mean, when we first took, um, I guess, uh, tenancy, to the space, it was it was used as a kitchenette. It was a small galley kitchen, but it was in really rough shape. Um, it had at some point been the kitchenette for an apartment that was here on this level of Warner Castle that had been abandoned a long time ago. Um, and so we decided to repurpose this room uh, for a, a kitchenette and a staff workroom. We have our copy machine here, our mail machine. So it's it really availed itself really well for that purpose. We did. Um, you might notice that the flooring sort of mirrors. Looks, looks consistent from downstairs. Yeah, and, and we, we really did that on purpose. Um, if you would go into the basement, there's black and white um, tile floors there. We have the marble on the main entry hallway, and we really wanted to not mimic that, but we wanted to play off of it. And, and I think most people sort of, you know, kind of understand that design feature. It's a, it's a, I think it's a neat feature that sort of carries throughout uh, the building. Now this room also is, uh, has an attached bathroom or restroom. Right. And we decided, I know at one point we talked about getting rid of the restroom, yeah. we ended up keeping it. Yeah, I mean, I think the original discussions was, you know, do we really need uh, another full bath off of the kitchenette? The answer was no, we really didn't need it. But it was gonna cost us more money to really remove it and we didn't need the space. So we went ahead and retained it. Uh, there is a, a historic corner uh, sink that is, is really quaint that we decided to keep and, and people seem to enjoy that. I had one of those corner sinks in my own home for, oh, yeah. for a number of years. It's quite the conversation piece. It is, it is. So, so we're glad that we kept it in the end. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really nice space because uh, it's, it's centrally located too on this floor with all the offices. And you decorated it nicely and I noticed there's some neat artwork. Yeah, you know, it's, I'm, it's glad, I'm glad you pointed that out because this artwork uh, has special meaning to the Landmark Society. Um, this is the work of John Wenrick, who is an amazing watercolorist. He started his career out doing uh, architectural renderings in watercolor and then transitioned later into different types of paintings and uh, really got into historic trains. And so we really wanted to, I, I think, honor uh, John Wenrick in this room and, and, and display some of his watercolors. I think it goes well and the colors seem to blend well with the paintings too. So. Well you guys did a wonderful job in this room because yeah. it certainly did not look like this one when yeah. uh, we first got yeah. in. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, Joe. Well done. Yeah. Thanks.
So John, here we are out on the loggia of the castle. Tom, what is a loggia? Well, a loggia is sort of a fancy term for porch. And this was originally an open porch on the castle. We have some photographic evidence of that in the past. Um, but when we all arrived uh, on site here, the uh, space had been enclosed probably back in the late 50s or early 60s, judging from the sort of roadside motel sort of aesthetic yes, uh, that it yes. had from the outside. Um, and so this is probably one of the major interventions that Landmark is undertaking here at the castle. So we are uh, reconstructing this back wall with more windows to take advantage of the views. We're inserting a uh, handicap lift here, which will provide handicap accessibility to the main level of the castle for the first time in its history. And then this space over here will be another small meeting room. And kind of as is common, once you start digging into things in an older building, you start finding things. Yes, yes, and we did find things. Uh, if you look at the rafters right here, you can see they taper from maybe 10 inches to an inch and a half max, which is clearly not enough to support the loads on the roof. It almost looked like an optical illusion when That's you right. first uh, yes. opened it up. Yes, because I'm not sure I've ever seen anything quite do that. That's not a normal way, even uh, in buildings of this age. So we had that challenge, and we solved it by sistering on much bigger beams. You can see behind me the joists that we have a couple up there, the rafters. Um, another challenge we had was a lot of rot in these beams as they hit the masonry. Water had been getting in, it was rotting out. We had to take it all out, couldn't leave any of it. We're putting new beams up, basically redoing the structure from the top down all the way to the masonry down there. You had said some of that was more like mulch than uh, structural uh, I would wood. call it dust. Yeah. Dust. And hopefully um, the windows are on order and we'll be arriving here in the, in the near future. Yes, yep, yep. Uh, windows should be here soon and it won't let in as much light as you see here, but certainly it's gonna provide a much nicer view of the sunken gardens and the backyard here. I'd like to thank our donors and all of our partners who helped us make this a reality because without you, it just simply would not have happened. You know, this project is important not because it simply saved an iconic historic structure like Warner Castle, but it's also important because it really solidifies and anchors this entire neighborhood, including Highland Park area and our neighbors on the historic Reservoir Street area. I'd like to thank our donors, our volunteers, and the tradespeople who made this vision a reality. And we hope to see you soon here in person. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna have to pass on this. Yep. <laughs> Great. Yep. <laughs>